outlook for 2023 is low growth, high inflation, more debt with quantitative tightening, that means less liquidity, but elevated deficits from governments, that means less liquidity for markets, less balance sheet, lower balance sheet of central banks, plus rising deficits or at least very elevated deficits being financed in any shape or form by governments means that all of that money is not going to be going to equities or bonds. Means that we are likely to see between five to ten trillion dollars less liquidity in the market and this is likely to affect particularly private equity which benefited from very high multiple expansion, high yield bonds, sovereign bonds, and those equities that require constant refinancing with increases of capital. So if you think about that, if we saw a massive increase in valuations globally with a 20 trillion uh, addition of liquidity from central banks, each unit of liquidity generated by those central banks is multiplied in the market by around three to five times, it depends on which area, quantitative tightening of three to 10 trillion, including the deficit spending that will be financed, is likely to erode valuations and certainly uh, put a lot of pressure on those sectors that require constant refinancing via equity and constant improvements in valuation to justify their existence. The global slump in equity and bonds is generating some opportunities, certainly. But one of the most uh, difficult ones to think of is this generalized view that we are seeing all over consensus that the big bet for 2023 has to come from bonds. Why do I think that bonds are challenging in the current environment? First, because the estimates of inflation for 2023 continue to be elevated. Second, because the solvency of many of the issuers, particularly in high yield and in sovereign bonds, is not getting better, it's getting worse. Solvency is getting worse, inflation is still persistent and elevated. And third, because it's very, very difficult to believe that investors are going to accept rising levels of uh, access to bonds, rising uh, percentages of bonds in their portfolios in an environment of quantitative tightening. Think about this. What generated the massive increase in the number of negative yielding bonds was high liquidity and low rates. Therefore, it is very unlikely that we will see a big move into bonds from investors that will offset the quantitative tightening. Cryptocurrencies cannot rise in an environment of quantitative tightening because cryptocurrencies need high liquidity and low rates. That is what made those assets go up in value in the market. And certainly it is very, very difficult for cryptocurrencies as an asset class to show strength in an environment of quantitative tightening. We have seen it in 2022 only with rate hikes. The next step is central banks cutting their balance sheet. And that is a much more challenging environment than what many think. When we think of quantitative tightening, very few people understand what it implies for valuation of assets. Quantitative easing generated a massive increase in valuations, increased in multiples, and uh, the, an elevated valuation that was generalized because of the thought that things could only go up. Unfortunately, when quantitative tightening starts, the impact 
i.e. the reduction in valuations and multiples, is yet to be seen. And it might, it might be much larger than what we initially estimated. So think about this. Quantitative tightening is not good for any asset that requires multiple expansion. Are we close to a global debt crisis? Very unlikely. I don't think that there's going to be a massive debt crisis. Do I think that there is massive risk in high yield and sovereign bonds? Yes. Why? Because the yield that one is paying compared with the risk that the uh, bonds have, including the weakening of the solvency ratios of the issuers, is way too high. I mean, it doesn't make any sense, to be fairly honest, at these levels, to think that it is a good uh, risk-reward scenario to think of bonds of issuers that are getting much worse earnings profiles, much worse margins, and certainly weaker cash flows uh, with the idea of 4-5% yields in an environment in which the world is expecting inflation to remain elevated, not in 2023, but also in 2024. Obviously, bond yields are reflecting a uh, more likely reality right now, but not nearly enough if we think about it with what we are expecting in terms of inflation. So you cannot bet on one thing and the opposite. You cannot think that you're going to have a very attractive environment for bonds while at the same time central banks make quantitative tightening and on top of that you continue to have elevated inflation. It's, it's a very, very challenging one and certainly can generate not a global debt crisis but we can see a debt crisis in some of the riskier areas. Which ones were the riskier areas? We talked about negative yielding bonds. Think about all of those issuers that, that issued their bonds in 2018 to 2020 at negative rates and where they are now in terms of solvency and liquidity. That's where the risk is as well as in the more cyclical side of high yield. Central banks need to reduce their balance sheet. In the case of the European Central Bank, the strategy is to reduce the balance sheet via the reduction in the quantity for TLTROs, i.e. the liquidity injections targeted at banks, uh, and the maturity of sovereign bonds. But somebody has to tell me, how are governments in the European Union, in the Eurozone, that are still counting on elevated deficits and increasing debt, how are they going to be able to finance themselves and at the same time control their budget with rising interest rates? Euribor is now at around 2.5%. At those levels, it is very unlikely that investors are going to accept negative real rates on bonds of sovereign issuers. The European Union countries were hugely benefited by the fallacy of printing money. They increased their imbalances, and now governments like the Spanish, the Italian, uh, and others are counting on very aggressive deficit spending programs to continue to be financed in some way by the market. But the central bank is not there anymore. Are we going to see a debt crisis in the European Union? It is likely if governments continue to ignore the risks of rising spreads and rising yields. But it's, governments only react when the problem is already a crisis. And unfortunately, what we will see in 2023 is that most European governments are not going to reduce their imbalances, they're going to increase them. And that can lead to a very significant risk when the European Central Bank 
has to tackle elevated inflation for another year. The global real disposable income of consumers is being demolished. The inflationary tax is destroying the purchasing power of uh, salaries. You wanted stimulus, you wanted high spending, you wanted those enormous packages provided by governments and central banks, there you have it. Inflation. Inflation is taxation without legislation. The reality of 2023 is that uh, the famous words of Ronald Reagan who said that inflation is the price of the things that you thought were free that government gave you uh, it certainly is come to fruition. What we have in front of us is not an environment of strength. It's an environment of weakness. And what citizens all over the world are seeing is a weakening of the purchasing power of their salaries and their savings. That is, generalized impoverishment. Cyclical stocks have started to underperform. And there's a reason for it, is that macroeconomic estimates are worsening. The uh, expectations of growth for 2023 are now that the world is going to grow at about 1.8%, which is phenomenally bad. And on top of that, with elevated inflation. Low growth, elevated inflation, the risk of stagflation is rising. And stagflation is not good for cyclical stocks. Cyclical stocks require high growth, high improvement in margins and certainly an environment in which uh, consumers feel much better about the prospects of the future. Chinese reopening is certainly good news. If we look at the very drastic slump in the Chinese economy coming from the misguided zero-COVID policy, uh, it has been much worse than what the government probably expected. And it's not just been very poor in terms of economic growth, but also it has generated a massive level of discontent. However, we also must remember that the reopening is only part of the solution for the Chinese economy. The problems of the Chinese economy were uh, longer lasting and certainly more important and became uh, prior to the zero COVID policy. The biggest problems of the Chinese economy were the following. First, obviously, a very elevated dependence on debt to grow. Uh, China went from being a country that needed uh, one unit of debt to generate 0.5 units of GDP to being a country that required six units of debt to generate one unit of GDP. And this old economy that relied heavily on debt, which came fundamentally from construction, real estate, and the uh, industrial sectors that are closer to government, were uh, the ones that the government was trying to push to one side in order to let the new economy thrive and uh, become less dependent on debt. However, still in 2020, and 2019, the level of dependence on debt of the Chinese economy was too high. So that's one thing that certainly needs to be addressed. Another thing that needs to be addressed is the huge dependence of the regions on the revenues coming from the real estate sector. The burst of the real estate bubble in China is certainly going to leave a very significant financial hole on the uh, accounts of the regional governments. And that is a big issue as well, coming back to the debt issue that we mentioned before. So uh, the third problem of the Chinese economy was the massive intervention in technology and other uh, thriving sectors. The government decided to intervene very aggressively on sectors that could actually offset 
the slump in the old economy ones. And that created a second problem added to the one that was generated by the slump in the real estate sector. Therefore, what needs to happen is a, is, is, is a change in policy that brings China back to a more open economy, an, an economy that attracts investment, that doesn't close and intervene on sectors, and that allows the middle class to continue to thrive. If not, the big Achilles heel of the Chinese economy is going to be the yuan. The local currency is likely to be heavily devalued if the government continues to put brakes on the improvement of the largest and more uh, added value sectors. So we'll pay attention to that because... Uh, Let's think about this. It's an economy that needs a lot of debt and at the same time requires a strong currency. And both things cannot happen. The yuan has capital controls and a fixed pricing, and it's very difficult for it to be a world reserve currency maintaining those capital controls. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my channel, like my videos, leave your comments below, and Keep defending freedom. Thank you very much.